For as long as any of us can remember, there was always a fun, free, and fascinating form of entertainment and information right at our fingertips. Now this, getting the bite put on us. Frank Farrell says he's lucky in that regard because any time he thinks about getting intimate with a woman, she just holds his hands, looks at them, and says, You've got psoriasis. Even with all its frailties, radio always seemed to have that human element that made it so endearing. And the station must have the world's biggest scratch record collection. They once played Locomotion, it skipped for three days, August 14th through the 17th, 1986. <laughs> Don't they have DJs? Only one. Must be a relief when he goes on. Not really, he stutters. For aficionados on both sides of the speakers, there was a mystique about radio. How stations operated, how transmitters transmitted, and for listeners, how radio people looked. Unless, of course, you were one of the 9 to 15 people who showed up at some of the live broadcasts. Television has tried valiantly to capture that mystique over the years with some really good shows such as Frasier, News Radio, and of course, the iconic WKRP in Cincinnati. Turning to sports. <laughs> Winner of this week's Gulf Coast Golf Classic was... Chai Chai Rotraguiz. <laughs> Chai Chai finished with a nine under par score. Chi Chi Rodriguez. <laughs> Hopefully, Mr. Rodriguez will play up to par. Seeing these amplitude modulation and frequency modulation morons on the small screen was one thing, but who would pay for that? Well, if you went to the movies, that's exactly what you did. And you expected something for your money. After all, who in their right minds would pay for radio? With that, we'll examine my five favorite movies about radio. And before we begin, a trivia question. What movie caused radio stations around the country to not only edit a specific song, but change the lyrics? Or one lyric. So sit down and listen. Or, or watch, and we will... I said, sit down. Don't make me use my radio voice. Number five, Melinda. Lock up your daughter's girlfriends and wives, Mr. Jones, because Frankie J is on his way. This 1972 black exploitation sleeper follows an enigmatic Detroit DJ who's as smooth with the ladies as he is with this on-air banter. The jock, played by Calvin Lockhart, meets a beautiful woman, which is usually the case with the women who call radio DJs, and the two wind up spending a romantic evening together. I didn't say you could sit. Oh, I'm sitting because you are a lady from another town. You don't know anybody. You're beautiful. And I'm beautiful. So it's only natural that we would gravitate toward each other. How did you know I was from another place? Brilliant mind perceptions, that's what I am. Just another one of the things that makes me so special. <laughs> I don't believe you. And I don't think you're fool enough to believe yourself. This sort of thing happens at least four to five times a week for most DJs. However, the next day, the gorgeous woman named Melinda, played by Vanetta McGee, winds up dead in his apartment. Now, this scenario is much rarer in real life, as it only occurs once or twice a week for most DJs. The twist and turn surrounding what winds up to be a mob hit is surprisingly intriguing. And since DJs are well known for their investigative skills, Lockhart sets out to find out who was behind this and why. He does get help from co-stars Rosalind Cash and Rockney Tarkington. You look tired. You're in trouble. Because you had to lie down in bed with that pretty face. Look, don't sweat it. Any time I can help a brother out, you know where I'm at. Although the 6'5 Tarkington looks and sounds like he should have been a football player, he was a veteran actor known for such shows as Danger Island, Doctari, and he was also one of the first African Americans to appear on The Andy Griffith Show. Now, you may or may not recognize the gentleman with me here, but I'm sure his name is familiar to all of you. Mr. Flip Conroy. Flip I don't want to embarrass you, Flip, but you are probably looking at one of the greatest pro football players of all time. Oh, I wouldn't go that far, but hi, fellas. 
Tarkenton was also supposed to play Williams in the Bruce Lee classic Enter the Dragon, but was replaced just before filming with Jim Kelly. The movie Melinda also featured Kelly in this his film debut. Although some parts are fairly predictable and typical for the era, Melinda still holds up well and is still very enjoyable to this day. Number 4. Talk Radio one of the dangers of expressing your opinions on the radio is that it can not only get you famous, it can also get you killed. Such was the real-life case with Denver Air personality Alan Berg. He was gunned down in 1984 by neo-Nazis. Four years later, the movie Talk Radio, partly based on Berg's career, was released. Now, I must admit, the first time I watched this Oliver Stone film, I wasn't enthralled at its dark message with negative characterizations. I did become more engrossed with subsequent viewings of the 1988 film that starred Eric Bogosian, Alec Baldwin, Ellen Green, and Leslie Hope. The film was based on the play of the same name that was written by Bogosian. Actually, the play was a finalist for Pulitzer Prize. A lot of me and Barry, there's no question about that. Um, I think Barry's a very extreme view of myself. I think, I, I think if I were as, as energized and uh, paranoid and uh, self-flagellating as Barry, I don't think I could last out a month, which is about how long I last doing him as a, uh -huh. for the film. Here's the plot. Bogosian's character plays a suit salesman who calls in regularly to a talk show. He's taken under the wing of that host and eventually he is given his own show and essentially steals his mentor's time slot. The topic is fantasy love affairs. Who would you like to have a love affair with? We're here with our good friend Barry. What's your name this week? Champlain, man. Barry Champlain. Barry Champlain, man, is here. Yeah. And uh, he has said his wife. Uh -huh. These are supposed to be famous people, Barry, unless your wife's gotten around a lot more than I think she has. No, no, come on. Your wife's not listening, okay? Who would you really like to get up close and personal with here? Up close and personal? Uh, Marie Osmond, I think, is very sexy. Mar in, uh, that's one for Marie Osmond. In black leather, yeah. Uh, the studio fish is blushing. You realize that? <laughs> You're making the studio fish blush. She blushing. is sex incarnate, man. She's like a... I, I mean, she's a Mormon, isn't she? I think a last Mormon's time I checked, believe yes. in bigamy? Okay, well then, uh, Marie, I want to marry you right now. Come down to the station. I want you, Marie. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take another caller. Yeah, you're on Talk of the Town. He's blessed with a caustic sense of humor and a knack for condescending to his audience with his controversial political views. They become a hit with many of his listeners, and as you can imagine, also earns the ire of many others. Oh, Chet, so nice to hear from you again. Shouldn't you be out burning crosses or molesting children or something? I'd much rather be talking to you. How about training pit bulls? Thank you so smart. You get the package I sent down to the station. Package? You got it. I know you did. Well, you sent me a present, Chet? See, I couldn't decide whether to use a timer or not. Guess you'll just have to find that out when you open it. Wait a minute. Hold on, hold on. You're telling me you sent me a bomb in the mail? Wrapped in brown paper. See, I know you're looking at it right now. Yeah, you just take some C4, roll it in a pile of nuts and bolts, and it uh, pebbles. It does the job. Sounds interesting, Chad. I didn't receive your package. Yeah, you sure you sent it to the right address? You got it. See, if I were you, I'd have my pretty assistant give the police a call. Take the bomb squad about ten minutes to get down Bomb squad? Why, why, why should I call the bomb squad, Chet? Because some pinheaded redneck moron calls me up and tells me there's a bomb in my mail? He who laughs last Yeah, oh, laughs shut up. There were a couple of call-ins that were more than a little uncomfortable. Yeah, what are you scared of, babe? I still have somewhat mixed feelings about the film's message, though I thought it was profound when he confessed his true intentions, admitting that he cares more for personal gain than the societal ills he addresses. Yet he refuses to apologize for his hypocrisy. I rarely listen to talk radio, but I can't watch talk radio or listen to talk radio without hearing this message. The film ends tragically, although differently, than the Allen Berg incident. As popular as the talk format is, one has to wonder if the host and listeners would be just a bit more serene if they embraced more of their favorite music. Number 3. FM 
It wasn't that long ago when if you wanted to hear the hottest hits and the most popular DJs on the radio, you naturally turned to an AM station. Many owners had AM-FM combos, but the FM side was treated more like the bastard child at the family reunion. The formats on that frequency usually appealed to stoners who had no clue what they were listening to anyway and were manned by the company's burnouts who may have whizzed on the boss's leg at the last Christmas party. That part of the organization itself was generally regarded as a tax write-off. Things began to change in the mid to late 70s. Listeners realized that music sounded better in FM stereo, and those listeners who hated music converged onto the AM talk formats, like flies buzzing around a horse's souvenirs. FM was the name of the game, and also the name of the 1978 movie touting the antics of the popular fictitious LA radio station Q-Sky. It's that time again, Dugan. In three minutes I'm gone, and this place belongs to you. So move it, baby. I know it's hard to believe, but there was a time in radio where if there wasn't a live human being in the studio, <laughs> there'd be trouble. Especially if the previous live human being refused to cover for you. Chaos wouldn't ensue, but dead air would, which was almost as bad. Fortunately, DJs have a well-earned reputation for being prompt and punctual. Good morning, Los Angeles. It's great to be a winner in our wheel. Michael Brandon played Jeff Dugan, the morning man and program director who has to make a difficult choice that few in radio management ever have to encounter. The creativity of the on-air staff or increasing revenue with controversial commercials. The air staff includes Eileen Brennan. I've always enjoyed her acting. She plays Mother, as well as Cleavon Little, who is the Prince of Darkness. Other DJs include Alex Karras and Martin Mole. Eric, sweetheart, we don't know what you're doing in there, but whatever it is, it's going out to the whole world. Your mic's on, you jerk! And trouble's on the way! Honestly, I've never been a big Martin Mole fan, but his character of Eric Swan, the egotistical, womanizing jerk who later has a breakdown, seems more aligned with his real persona and works pretty well here. What I did was, uh, I, uh, mixed together some, a new sound effects record. The sounds of love and intertwined it with some folk music from uh, France. I'm now back to something a little more traditional. Hope you enjoyed it. Hi, what's the matter? Don't, what's the matter, me? I heard what's going on in here. What are you all doing in here? Hey, come on, come on, artist at work. Eric. I'm trying to create. Out, 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 out. Kathy, before you go, would you file this for me? Please, or do you want to take it home with us? <laughs> Come on, fans I love, but not while I'm working, okay? Out, 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 okay? Lamar, Mr. Lamar, sorry. sorry. Can you uh, shut that at you? You're a great guy. Okay, thank you very much. Love your jacket and stuff. Nice bit of... Was that good? Later in the movie, the staff rebels and chaos ensues, which is a typical Thursday at most radio stations. FM is often believed to be the inspiration for WKRP in Cincinnati, but in fact, the sitcom was already in development and the pilot for KRP was filmed before the movie's release. The movie actually didn't do that well at the box office, but the soundtrack sold over a million records. Steely Dan's title track, FM, No Static at All, was a winner at the 1979 Grammys. Speaking of the Steely Dan hit... This was the answer to our trivia question. Many AM stations played an edited version of it with an overdubbed A, which was substituted for the F of FM. Yes, that was effing weak. Always remember, FM has no static at all, and CDs do not skip. Number 2. Good Morning Vietnam for a very long time, the U.S. involvement in Vietnam was an extremely difficult topic to broach. Whether in political terms, sociological terms, or even dramatic terms. Doing so from a serial comedic point of view was even more challenging. 
Now, Robert Altman was able to accomplish this with the 1970 movie MASH, but only by disguising the time and place to the Korean conflict. However, by 1987, we awoke to an entirely new approach to this. Good morning, Vietnam! Hey, this is not a test. This is rock and roll. Time to rock it from the Delta to the DMZ. Is that me or does that sound like an Elvis Presley movie? Viva Da Nang. Oh, Viva Da Nang. Da Nang me, Da Nang me. Why don't they get a rope and hang me? Hey, is this a little too early for being that loud? Hey, too late. It's 0600. What's the O stand for? Oh, my God, it's early. Speaking of early, how about that Crow Magnon, Marty Drywitz? Thank you, Marty, for silky smooth sound. Make me sound like Peggy Lee. AFVN, rocking you from the Delta to the DMZ. AFVN, better than AFVD, which means you have to get a quick shot. What's the difference between the Army and the Cub Scouts? Ah, uh, Cub Scouts don't have heavy artillery. Talking out the field today. Hi, what's your name? My name's Bob Fibber. Bob, what do you do? I'm in artillery. Thank you, Bob. Is we play anything for you? Anything, just play it loud, okay? Good Morning Vietnam chronicled a popular and unorthodox DJ named Adrian Cronauer, who shakes up things when he is assigned to the U.S. Army Services radio station in Vietnam in 1965. The script went through several revisions after it was originally drafted by the real Adrian Cronauer, who first pitched it as a TV series, then a movie of the week. That's when it landed in the lap of Robin Williams, who realized this would be the perfect outlet for his brand of comedy. Robin Williams ad-libbed all of Cronire's broadcasts. The movie co-starred future Oscar winner Forrest Whitaker, Robert Wool, and Bruno Kirby as the incredibly zany Lieutenant Hawk. Well, some thought he was zany. Well, he thought so anyway. Sir, sir, we even knew just one thing, but this stuff you wrote, it's not funny, sir, it's sad. Sir, I'm begging you, don't try to do comedy. It's not in your blood. I'll do fine. Comedy is what you make it. I've got pages and pages of great material. Right, Abersol? I'm afraid you're going to be hitting bottom, sir. If it isn't funny, then why did I hear you laughing when you typed it? I was thinking of something else. Thank you for your support. Now I've got to show it. Sir, you're not funny. Ask around. Sometimes comedy is best left to the professionals, a real comedian, as opposed to the guy you sit next to at work all day. Sir, in my heart, I know I'm funny. Thank you, Lieutenant. Director Barry Levinson refused to let the real Adrian Cronauer and Robin Williams meet during the film's production. Levinson feared that if the two had met, Williams would subconsciously mimic Cronauer doing his performance, negatively affecting the characterization. Picture a man going on a journey beyond sight and sound. He's entered the demilitarized zone. Robin Williams and Cronauer would eventually meet at the movie's premiere. As for the accuracy of the film, Cronauer stated that it was about 45% accurate. He did have to contend with the censors editing his news, but he says the film paints him as anti-war when he was more anti-stupidity. Cronauer also said that if he had done half the things Williams did in the film, he would have been court-martialed and sent to Fort Leavenworth prison. You know, you're in more dire need of a blowjob than any white man in history. Interestingly, after Adrian Cronauer left the military, several disc jockeys would take over his show on Armed Forces Radio, opening the show with his famous line, Good Morning Vietnam. One of those DJs would be a 22-year-old named Pat Sajak, who did the show from 1968 to 1969. Number 1. Play Misty For Me in my considered and humbled opinion, if you ever aspire to enter the illustrious, glamorous world of radio, as soon as you graduate from the Academy, this movie should be required viewing. And that goes for men and women, since they are deranged Evelyns of both genders, awaiting your etymological charisma and linguistic charms. Ah, who am I kidding? You wouldn't heed that warning anyway, as you'll be swayed by the first pretty face you see on the studio phone, telling you how wonderful you sound, and how they'd like to do something freaky with dairy products. We know your type. In this movie, Clint Eastwood plays Dave Garver, and he was just such a slut. 
Like most DJs, he lived in a scenic crib on the beach in Carmel-by-the-Sea, California. And he wasn't even the mayor yet. But he did prefer the familiar surroundings for making this movie, which was his directorial debut. He was well known around town, especially at his favorite bar where the bartender aids and abets him when scouting new talent. This particular time, that talent happens to be a woman named Evelyn, who pretends she was stood up for a date, but she knew who Dave was and where he would be. She was stalking him and knew everything. Caramel, Dave Garner speaking. Hello. Hi, what will it be? Play Misty for me. Misty, huh? We have that right on the play rack. Thanks for calling. I see you got your little Misty chick calling you again. Jessica Walter, who still gives me chills for her performance, played Evelyn Draper. Now, Evelyn is portrayed as a delusional psychopath, but seriously, would a psychotic person care enough to give you a haircut while you sleep? Or sabotage a job interview with a radio producer that could take your show nationally? You know, if this show goes the way I think it's going to, there's no reason in the world why... Well, isn't this cozy? So this is your business lunch? How's business? Friend of yours? Just another trick, honey. That's enough. Is that your idea of a dish? My God, she's a little old for you, isn't she? What is this, be kind to senior citizens week? Get out of here. It's not that I mind you being a bastard, but do you have to be such a tasteless bastard? Hey, hey, yeah, I guess so. Maybe it was because that producer sort of looked like Aunt Peg. In any case, Dave had a big problem, especially since people like Evelyn do not go away easily or quietly. The movie also co-stars Clarice Taylor, who is the housekeeper birdie that becomes Evelyn's victim. Fortunately, she survives this trauma well enough to later become the Huxtable grandmother on The Cosby Show. One of the fun backdrops to this movie are the scenes filmed at the Monterey Jazz Festival. Here you can see Dave sporting around with Donna Mills, who plays Toby, Dave's singer ex, who left him previously because of his womanizing. By now, Dave has learned his lesson, and he and Toby share a tender moment on the beach. But what to do about Evelyn? I'm going to let you watch the movie and see how it winds up, if you don't know already. For many years after this movie came out, women would call up real DJs on the air, and as a joke would say, play Misty for me, thinking it was so darn funny unaware of the consequences. Well, it's a good thing I keep an extra pair of jeans in my office. <laughs> Suffice to say, there are two types of people you should never tick off. Someone who serves you food and is out of your line of sight for any period of time. Don't let me go. Or someone who shares your bed and you are likely to fall asleep there. Especially when there may be sharp objects around. If you like this video, please check out some of the others I have on my channel and also subscribe where you'll be notified whenever I post new content. Oh, and don't forget to hit the like button and you're welcome to leave a comment anytime you so desire.